uh, I mean, the whole presentation is about what is a code retreat, right? Uh, so we'll talk more about what the global day of code retreat is when, when it makes sense to do that. Um, so uh, just some, some origins. Code retreat was started in 2009. The original idea came up at a conference, not all that different from the Saturn conference, when some, uh, some friends met for lunch and they were talking about the lack of practice in our industry. We heard uh, Mary talk about the lack of rigor in our industry. This is a very similar problem uh, that they identified and they're like, what can we do to help in infuse more practice and more rigor into our industry? And what they identified was this thing that we now called code retreat. Um, the, when, we, when we first, uh, so the big thing that we focus on at a code retreat, which is a kind of a one day workshop for professional developers, is we focus on the concept of the cost of change. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, unknowns in our industry, but one thing that's really obvious is that your code is going to change over time and your architecture is going to change. So how can we write uh, code or, or design architectures that are, have a lower cost of change, that are easier to change over time than other, other techniques? And this is what we really focus on when we're doing a, a, a code retreat. Uh, the way that we do that uh, is by talking about the four rules of simple design. Uh, these come from the extreme programming community. Kent Bank Beck originally came up with these. Um, uh, and we talk about these rather than other principles because they're very easy to comprehend very quickly. We only have a one day with the participants that are at, at the code retreat. Uh, so we focus on these. We could study other principles. We could study, study design patterns and things of that nature. But those usually require a lot more explanation. And one of the goals of code retreat is to be a hands-on, sort of uh, workshop. And it's much easier to do that with the four rules of simple design than other uh, types of principles. Um, throughout the day, we are always pair programming. Uh, this is really important. We, we think that it's a great way for ideas to spread. Uh, and throughout the day, people are swapping pairs. Uh, we actually work in 45 minute iterations. So for one code retreat, we make through about uh, five to six sessions. Uh, and between each session, we swap pairs. So uh, in a typical code retreat, you'll end up uh, pairing with five or six different people. You'll get to see how they approach the problem. Uh, you'll get a, a lot of new and interesting ideas that way. Um, in between, at the end of every uh, iteration, we'll pause and do a short retrospective to talk about what we learned in that session. What was interesting? What problems did you encounter? What can you uh, take from this in the real world? Uh, those sorts of things. Uh, and then, this is actually really important, at the end of ev every iteration or session, we delete all of the code that we wrote and we start over again. Now, one of the, uh, uh, the goals of Code Retreat and why it, gets the, why it has the name Retreat in it is that uh, the, the founders of Code Retreat uh, sort of observed that most developers do all of their learning on the job. Um, and the problem with that is that we're always working under the deadline. It doesn't matter what role in the software industry you're in. Uh, you might be the architect, you might be a business analyst or a developer. All of them are you're constantly working on under, the, uh, under a deadline. And the problem with that is that uh, Oftentimes, you need to cut corners to meet deadlines. And meeting deadlines is really important, right? Uh, if we don't meet deadlines, we can't make money. If we're a software company or if we're uh, any other kind of company, deadlines are just as important. But it's not a good place to experiment, right? It's, it doesn't give you the freedom to go and uh, play around with test-driven development like you've always wanted to, but you don't have the time to do it because you've got the deadline. It doesn't give you the freedom to try a new technique that you think might be interesting uh, because you don't have the time. You've got to get the code done, right? And so uh, Code Retreat is, express, is specifically designed to eliminate that pressure. And it's, it's so pre prevalent that um, it's really hard for people to let go of the deadline. So we do this in two ways. One is by working through the uh, 45 minute iterations, we work on a problem called 
uh, Conway's Game of Life. I'll talk about that in a minute. It's impossible to finish Conway's Game of Life in 45 minutes, and that's on purpose. And we're deleting the code at the end of every session. So A, it's impossible to finish, and it doesn't matter if we finish anyway, because we're just going to throw it all the way. So, so what we coach uh, participants to do is to not even try to finish. Instead, focus on what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and it's really interesting over the course of the day how this sort of evolves. Initially, the, after that first session, there's all kinds of pain in deleting the code. You know, like people are really resistive to it. There's lots, lots of groans in the room. Um, but then by the end of the day, people are really comfortable with it. And one of the interesting things that happens is that people have writ, write less code progressively throughout the day in every session. So they'll start by like trying to do as much as they possibly can before the deadline, and then, um, and then it gets deleted and they're really frustrated about it. And by the end of the day, they're focused on uh, just one class. They, they spend all 45 minutes just exploring one class or one set of tests. And they've really slowed down and really started to focus on their, their technique. Um, so it, it really works. It's really interesting. Um, I, I mentioned Conway's Game of Life. Uh, it is a cell automation simulation problem. It comes from a mathematician named John Conway. There's no relation to this, to Conway's law. I mentioned that because that's come up a bunch in the conference. Um, this, is, this is completely different. Basically, what Conway was setting out to prove mathematically is that complex systems can evolve from very simple rules. Um, I don't need to go into the details here. It's not really relevant to the presentation. The big thing is, is that the problem it, it looks simple on the, front, on the face of it, but it has some nice subtleties and nuances that allow us to explore a lot of interesting designs and a lot of interesting uh, 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 architectures within our code that a simpler problem may not be able to provide us with. Um, we don't, uh, every session is a little bit guided. We need to put a little bit of structure around things to help guide the participants' learning. And we do that by applying constraints to every session or exercises. Um, a lot of these are about removing a particular tool or a concept that people are used to working with and forcing them to work without it. So an example of that would be telling people that they can't uh, use, that all of their methods must be void. They can't have any return values at all. And that leads to a very different code architecture than, than what people are normally used to working with. Or uh, another example of that might be there's an exercise where nobody's allowed to talk. The only way they can communicate is through the code that they're writing. And that's very interesting when you're pair programming. And, and, and uh, the code changes when you do that. And what does it look like? These are, so most of the, the exercises are constraints. Take away something uh, to explore a different kind of a design alternative than what you might have thought of otherwise. So that's the format, and, and, and that's basically what, how a code retreat works. But what do people actually learn from code retreat? They actually learn a lot of things. It's very interesting. Um, one thing is that code retreat is really good for learning about uh, microarchitectures. You know, what is the, uh, rather than a, a big system architecture, what is a good in architect, internal code architecture of a single component of a system? Code Tree is really good about exploring that. Uh, I mentioned that um, by applying different constraints, the internal structure of that component can change dramatically. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there to look at what you can do there. Um, more specifically, one of the, some of the common uh, themes that we've seen throughout Code Retreats throughout the years is that uh, software developers in particular tend to gravitate towards the lowest level abstraction available to them. So when we start out with Conway's Game of Life, uh, people tend to represent a cell which can either be dead or alive as Booleans. Uh, but that's a very, very uh, uh, primitive way to represent that abstraction and it quickly gets people into trouble throughout the day. So what they discover is that it's better to sometimes, in some designs, um, introduce higher levels of abstraction, like a cell class, and instead of representing dead or alive with a Boolean, use an enumeration instead. 
And by doing that, the internal structure of the code changes, and usually in a positive way that, makes the, that reduces the cost of change. Um, we've also noticed that, uh, and this is, everybody knows this, right? Our assumptions have heavily influenced the designs. Uh, but what CoderTreat does is it really reveals what those assumptions are and just how ingrained they are into us. Almost everybody, like 99% of the people who've done a coder treat, start with a two-dimensional array to represent the universe. And so then they have the concept of X and Y, and then it starts to bleed all throughout the architecture. Uh, every method takes an X and a Y, and you have repeated nested for loops that iterate through the, the iterations. Um, and this is great, uh, it's fine until you change the rules on the participants, which I love to do, and you tell them that they now need to do three dimensions. And this is sort of the reaction that you get all throughout the room, right? Like, oh my goodness, all my code has to change because I embedded the concept of location throughout all of my code. I didn't pull it out as a separate concern. I didn't isolate it properly. Um, so, uh, uh, another example of primitive obsession is the use of uh, conditionals instead of higher levels of abstraction like polymorphism. Uh, CoderTreat does talk a lot about object-oriented design. And this is, so one of the exercises we have is that you're not allowed to use conditionals at all. And it's specifically to explore this concept that um, to, uh, we tend to use uh, conditionals too much. We tend to gravitate towards them uh, and instead we have a much more powerful tool in our toolbox with object-oriented design with polymorphism and dynamic dispatch. So if we take away conditionals altogether, what do you get? What happens to your code? How, how, how far can we push the polymorphism extreme? Um, all of this leads to the ability to rapidly explore different design alternatives. One, one session, we're not using conditionals, so we're, we're following the polymorphism to an extreme. And the next session, we might flip it. And we might say, you're not allowed to use polymorphism at all. What does that extreme look like? So this format of 45-minute iterations where we're deleting the code is a great way to explore possible alternatives. Um, Another thing that we like to explore at CoderTreat is picking good names. Uh, it, it, it's really hard to write code that is expressive, that it, it tells the reader what it does. And the key to that is picking really good names for all of the pieces of your code, all of the classes inside of it. And uh, CoderTreat's a great place to do that um, as well. Uh, it's not just object-oriented focused, however. We do explore functional programming paradigms and the designs that fall out of that as well. For example, uh, we do like to explore immutable data structures and how does that change the, the architecture of the code. Uh, so, and, and of course, code retreat's a great environment to explore various developer practices. Many people um, know about uh, things like test-driven development, but they've never actually tried them before. And then they come to a code retreat and we force them to try it out. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes they like it and sometimes they don't. That's, that's great, but at least they've tried it. And now they can say, I don't like it because X, Y, Z, rather than I think I don't like it because somebody told me that it's bad. Uh, and then, of course, there's all sorts of other uh, developer practices that we can explore through code retreat. So uh, there are some things that CoderTreat is not good for. One of them is exploring large system architectures. If you're thinking of like a large microservices architecture, CoderTreat's not good for exploring that. It's good for zeroing in on one of the buildings in, in the system, but not looking at it as a whole. There's other workshops that are better designed for that. Um, it's also not a good place to learn really new things like a new programming language. It's a great place to try out a language to see what it sort of feels like, but you're not gonna walk away from a code retreat knowing a new language and all of the ins and outs of it. So we, we caution people on that. Um, it also breaks down if you have groups greater than 30 people. Uh, the pro code retreat is a very, uh, for lack of a better term, a very intimate kind of a, uh, a, a workshop. It's very socially intense. 
you're working with different people throughout the day, you're really, really focused on the code that you're writing, and it starts to break down if your group is big, greater than 30 people. It gets harder for the facilitator to manage it. Um, people start to be less open with each other, and, and, and the learning starts to decrease. So we try to keep code retreats at relatively small. Um, we've been doing code retreats publicly and also at IBM internally uh, uh, for many years. One of the advantages, there, and there's a number of reasons why you might want to do an internal code retreat instead of just running a public one. One of them is that it's really easy to find a place to hold a code retreat. When you run a public one, you've got to find a company that's willing to let outsiders come into the, the corporate building to hold the code retreat. That can sometimes be challenging. But if you run it internally, you can just use one of your meeting rooms, and that's not a problem at all. Um, lunch is really easy to organize when you run an internal code retreat. Usually, you don't have to do anything special. People can just bring their lunches like they normally do or go out for lunch, however they do that, or head down to the corporate cafeteria, whatever. Um, uh, the other advantage of an co internal code retreat is that everybody has a common background. Everybody understands the same programming language. That opens up other in in avenues of learning. At a public code retreat, um, this can sometimes become a distraction, and it can distract from some of the other things that are really interesting. Um, you don't have that distraction at an internal code retreat. Uh, likewise, uh, it's really easy to talk about the problems you have at work and how, they, uh, and how the things that you're learning at the code retreat relate to those problems uh, at work. You can do that at a public code retreat, but not at the same level that you can at an internal one. Um, and so at IBM, we found this to be a really powerful uh, tool for bringing up the skill level of our developers. Uh, we're trying to do some very, very ambitious things with Watson, and not everybody is at the level they need to be, to be for us to be able to do that. Uh, and so we're finding that Code Retreat is a great way to bring everybody up to the level where we need them to be. There are some challenges to running internals. Uh, one is, of course, convincing management to do this. Uh, and at, what we found is the best way to do this is to go through the things that I've already gone through in this presentation. Talk about all of the things that people are going to learn uh, from this. What is the, what is the return? that management is going to see from this investment. Um, another major challenge is clearing people's calendars. You need a full day for code retreat. Management often, or teams even say, well, I only have half a day. Well, that's not going to, not, you're not going to get enough out of the code retreat that way. You really need to work hard to clear the calendar. Sometimes this means chasing down other managers of other teams and convincing them to cancel that or reschedule that meeting so you can have a pure full day of no distractions for the team. Um, convincing employees can sometimes be challenging. They're like, oh, another corporate training. Why do I have to go to this? Um, it, it, it can be really difficult. There's two steps to this, to solving to this particular problem. The first is to find a, f a few willing people who really want to do this. Um, they're the kind of people who would have self-selected to go to a public code retreat. You get them, uh, and you do a code retreat with them. And then they go out to their teams, and they talk about what a wonderful experience it was. And, they can, and by word of mouth, then it starts to spread that this is really not your typical corporate training, and that it's worth going to. Um, this is an actual quote uh, from somebody within IBM. They, they said that Code Retreat was the first required corporate training that didn't suck. And we took that as, as success, right? Yes, they think it's awesome. So, so now what? Now that I've told you all about this wonderful thing called Code Retreat and the benefits that it can provide to a team, uh, what, what do you do with this information? Well, the first thing I would encourage you to do is to actually attend a code retreat. And it doesn't matter if you're into the code on a, on a daily basis or if you're a software architect working at a higher level, you will gain something out of attending a code retreat. Because you're constantly pair programming, it's actually really great to have people from different sub-disciplines within our industry. It really helps to spread ideas and build knowledge and understanding. Uh, there, code retreats are held all over the world. 
um, on a fairly frequent basis. This is actually a picture of the map from last year's Global Day of Code Retreat. Um, every November, we dedicate one Saturday to trying to run as many code retreats as we can all over the world all at once. Um, one of the interesting things we do during that day is uh, video chats across the locations so that participants can sort of share war stories and things that they've learned. Um, and that's very interesting because if you talk to somebody in a different country than you, they have a different perspective. They've probably learned something different than you have. Um, and this has become very popular. Last year, I think we had uh, 160 participating cities, which is really quite remarkable. Um, but after you've attended a code retreat, then I encourage you to try running one uh, in, 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 in your own company. You definitely want to attend one first to sort of get the sense of what it is and how it works. But after you've done that, by all means, experiment with it internally at, at your company. And uh, we have a lot of resources to help you to do that. Uh, the coderetreat.org site has uh, a number of resources there. One of the things that it has is a recorded training session. Um, leading up to the Global Day of Code Retreat, we run a lot of live training sessions to train people on how to run these things and how to facilitate them. We've recorded some of those sessions, so you can ju just grab them and watch those. Or uh, you could wait until the fall when we're running those sessions and join those. Even if you're not participating in Global Day, that's fine. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, blog posts, a lot of people have written about Code Retreat, both about their experiences attending them as well as their experiences running them. So if you just search for uh, blog Code Retreat, you'll get a lot of, of hits. And of course, many of those are linked off of the Code Retreat site as well. Uh, and, of, and last but not least, if you think this is really great, join the Code Retreat community. It's all volunteer driven, it's all grassroots, and we always need people to help out with stuff. Uh, I will admit, the CodeRetreat.org site is not nearly as good as it should be, and it would be great if there were some volunteers to help us with that, for example. Um, and so with that, uh, uh, do, do you have any questions? Right, so in the very early days of Code Retreat, we were really worried about this. Uh, so we limited the Code Retreats to a single language. It was usually Ruby or Java. But then um, a group in Romania actually said, that's crazy, uh, uh, let's see what happens if we let any language in. And it actually works fairly well. Um, it's just a different experience than when you're doing a Code Retreat internally. Um, there, there's, <laughs> and, and most of what you're learning, I mean, I, I think it's really cool, don't get me wrong, but most mm -hmm. of what you're learning seems to be coding skills and, and fairly low-level design skills. So could you imagine what the architecture retreat would be? Does that make sense where you're focusing more on, let's say, uh, design patterns, architectural patterns, and you could also improve performance or you know, whatever the most common thing is? Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that you could do is uh, but you could keep the, if you kept this, the, the core format, 45 minute iterations, uh, deleting all your work and starting over, uh, and then also applying constraints, different constraints to it, what in, in a, a more design focused code retreat might, the constraints would be different. So instead of um, saying that you can't have methods that don't return any values, maybe it's more of, uh, you're not allowed to use this particular design pattern. Like you're not allowed to use um, a, a, a singleton design pattern, for example. Or, um, and the sky's the limit there. Uh, whatever your imagination can come up with is probably, an, would be a very interesting experiment. Right, there's a, a slightly different, there's a lot of people experimenting with the format. There's uh, another uh, a, 
a similar thing called legacy code retreat where instead of starting with greenfield code, what happens if we start with really bad messy code and, and can we use the same structure for that? That's an example of where people have sort of experimented. That's right. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, when uh, there are some constraints that when we first started experimenting with code retreat that we don't recommend that people do anymore because we found that they, they led people down a really bad path. And so, yes, you do need to do some trial and error to sort of smoke those out. But at the same time, uh, some of these things are really, really, what we're trying to do is to try to push people to an extreme and you would never want to do that in the real world, right? Like you'd never want to actually write a system where none of the methods return any values. That would actually be really bad code. Um, and so I would say that it would be okay if there was some bad design things that came out of pushing people to a particular design extreme, just so not that, that we're, what, what you want to avoid is giving people dangerous ideas. And there were some constraints that we saw that were doing that. And the, the discussions that Michael was talking about, the, taking this small example and then talking about it in, at a larger context, those types of discussions tend to happen more at the internal code retreats than the public ones because people are like, uh, okay, this TDD thing is great, but how do I actually use it on my system that has this architecture that maybe doesn't make that conducive, for example. Um, so that's another advantage of an internal is that you can sort of jump up a level. Well, nobody's ever been disenchanted, thankfully. Uh, but there's two things. One is, as the facilitator, we can only make suggestions. And the, the reality is that sometimes people do save their code. Uh, they, they just hide it away and they don't use it for the rest of the session. The other thing is, since we've only been working for 45 minutes, people tend to be able to remember what they wrote. And it's not hard for them to reproduce it. Um, and but it's also not uncommon for at the, after a code retreat for people to go, man, I, I really wanted to finish that problem, but I never did, so I'm going to go and do that uh, this evening. And, and lots of people end up doing that, going and actually finishing the problem out. It very much depends on uh, the facilitator. And it, like, if it's a, well, we, 
we, we say that anybody can facilitate code retreat because if you don't know the answer to a particular question, somebody else in the room is going to know it. Um, but some facilitators who are, are more experienced can, be more, can do more coaching. Um, and so having done a lot of these, I find myself doing a lot of coaching. Whereas when I first started, I, I, I let the group do more of the, the self teaching to each other. Uh, but now that I've done it, I kind of know what some of the patterns are so I can guide them a little bit more. Well, well, so uh, coaching occurs all throughout the day. Um, part, part of it is uh, facilitating the retrospectives af afterwards, and that gives you, oftentimes the discussion will provide teachable moments where you can jump in and provide uh, experience gui experienced guidance to the participants. But it also happens during the sessions, the facilitator typically wanders around and visits the pairs Gets, get, understands what they're doing, and oftentimes will jump in and, and sort of coach them if they're, they're struggling or have problems. So sometimes the facilitator can suggest if they're seeing like certain problems or, or, or difficulties that groups are having you know, throughout a session, like, wow, we had six groups and four of them all bringing the same difficulty. Let's just talk about that together after the session. And, and kind of be that, the one person who has seen everyone else's code and suggest it. And very often uh, when, I, when I do a code retreat, I have a plan for the day, these are the constraints we're going to do, but that plan never sticks. I always change it throughout the day depending on where the group is going, what, what is the things that they're learning. Uh, like, it, it makes no sense in doing a constraint that helps people explore TDD if everybody already knows TDD, so I'll change the constraint to something else. Are you doing some of the constraints ahead of time? No, I'll, I'll reveal it as I go along throughout the day. So I have the freedom to change it throughout the day. Very good.